Wednesday, February 7th, 2018. Whiteface Mountain, Wilmington, New York. 49-year-old Toronto firefighter Danny Philippides is on a ski trip with eight other fellow firefighters, friends, and family members. It was the final day of the trip before the group would head back home. The mountain the group was skiing on that day was among the tallest of the Adirondacks. The end of the day was approaching, and a member of the group stated that he was feeling tired and was ready to return to the lodge. The others seemed to agree, however, Danny decides to make one final run down the mountain before he would meet back up with the others. He ventures off on his own, back up the mountain. It was around 16 degrees Fahrenheit, well into freezing temperatures, when a powerful snowstorm began to brew on the mountain. It would have certainly been difficult for Danny to see on his way down. Danny Philippides was no beginner when it came to skiing, but he wasn't exactly an expert either. An hour and a half would go by as the group waited for Danny in the lodge. By this point, it was now 4 o'clock. The ski lifts had closed for the day, and Danny's friends began to worry about where he was. The group waited for another 30 minutes before reporting their friend is missing. Left without options on the mountain, Danny's friends head back to the resort where they had been staying for the duration of their trip, finding their friend's car, phone, passport, and other personal items where they had been earlier that day before departing for the mountain. A large-scale search would swiftly develop on the mountain, first consisting of skiers and others familiar with the area, eventually growing to involve state police, federal authorities, and the friends and family of Danny. The search was conducted on the ground, as well as by air vehicles such as helicopters and drones. Throughout the week, thousands of different volunteers would head to Whiteface Mountain to search for the missing firefighter. You would assume that that many people would be able to find him, especially since they knew the general area where he disappeared, but Danny wouldn't be found on the mountain. In fact, Danny wouldn't even be found in the surrounding area. He wouldn't even be found in the state of New York. Miraculously, Danny would be found in Sacramento, California, a week after his disappearance. This case is just one of many that we will be investigating in today's final episode of the Unexplained Incidents Iceberg. As the sixth emotionally grueling day of the search was beginning to unfold, Danny's wife had just met up with the search party at the mountain, when her phone starts ringing. The call is from an unknown number. Luckily, she answers. It's Danny. She immediately picks out his voice as he begins to speak. He informs her that he's somehow at Sacramento International Airport, all alone, still in his ski gear. He wasn't even sure how he had obtained the iPhone he was using. In his possession, he had found a credit card, as well as a thousand dollars in cash. She told me, you know, everybody is looking for you. We're all here in Lake Placid. And I just remember the waves of emotion. Without much more discussion, Danny ends the call and dials 911 to inform them of the situation. When the authorities arrive at the airport a short time later, they find Danny, sure enough, still clad in his ski clothes, black helmet and goggles in hand. He was found in a bewildered state. They were lucky he was even able to place the calls to his wife and to 911. Danny had completely lost his sense of time and had no idea what day it was. He had apparently gotten a haircut at some point during his journey across the United States as well, just one of the many questions that still remain unanswered to this day. After a brief assessment by the Sacramento County Police, it was determined that despite his obvious confusion and disorientation, Danny was not impaired by drugs or alcohol and seemed otherwise to be in fine health. 
Danny was unable to inform the police of exactly how he arrived in Sacramento, but did seem to have a few sporadic memories of the journey. Although at this point it might have seemed that Danny arrived to California by airplane, this actually wasn't the case. Instead, after finally coming back to his senses and beginning to jog his memory, Danny started remembering little bits and pieces of where he had been over the last few days. He remembers being back at Whiteface Mountain on the day he disappeared, and believes that he got lost on his way back to his friends, before somehow losing consciousness and entering a state of delirium. It's not clear what happened after that. It's possible that he experienced some kind of a head injury at this point in time, perhaps he slipped and fell on his skis and hit his head on the ground. It's also possible that he entered into some kind of a strange fugue state. We'll dive deeper into these theories in a bit. After this point, he continued on, attempting to head to the ski lodge to find his friends, but when he arrived, he found it closed, which only confused him even more. Still in an incoherent state, Danny then remembers trying to hitchhike his way back into town by asking a truck driver for a ride. He then claims to have climbed into the cabin before they pulled away. Things became even more clouded after that, with Danny only recalling a handful of sparse and hazy memories over the next few days. He remembers being extremely fatigued, experiencing intense headaches. He seems to feel that he was mostly unconscious for most of the journey. Eventually, another memory came to him. At some point, he found himself standing near a truck stop and remembers the truck driver telling him that the two were now headed through the state of Utah. In what couldn't have been more than a day or two after that, Danny recalls the truck driver telling him that they reached, quote, the end of the line before he was dropped off in Sacramento. That's pretty much all he remembers. It's unclear who the truck driver was, why he took Danny all the way to Sacramento, or if he had anything to do with the strange state Danny was in. Shortly thereafter, Danny purchased an iPhone in an attempt to get help, but still wasn't completely out of his delirium. He couldn't remember his wife's phone number and ended up passing out on the street overnight before somehow getting a ride to the airport, remembering the phone number, and then calling his wife. Now, there are a few different theories as to what might have happened to Danny. The most prominent is that Danny, on his way down the mountain, may have fallen over and got a concussion and succumbed to amnesia as a result. However, this theory has a pretty big hole. Dr. Charles Tater, a Canadian brain surgeon who investigated the events, has stated that amnesia caused by a significant head injury can last from a few seconds up to around a day or two after the accident. But six days, Tater says, is unusual. Another theory, possibly in connection with the first, is that Danny entered a state of dissociative fugue, which is a condition where victims suddenly forget their own identity despite appearing normal to those around them. You may have heard of the similar, more prominent case of Hannah Up, a woman who left for a jog one day and three weeks later was found floating in a river without any idea how she got there. Victims of dissociative fugue are notorious for developing these desires to travel to seemingly random places for no reason. This obviously correlates with Danny's story. Again though, these are just guesses and there's really no answers to a lot of these other questions like why this truck driver would pick up a random person on the side of the road dressed in their ski clothes and drive them all the way across the country to California. Could this be some sort of strange case of kidnapping? Maybe there's a lot more to this story that Danny is simply unable to recall. International Space Station Air Leak August 29th, 2018, 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Daylight Time 
250 miles above the surface of the Earth and flying at approximately 17,500 miles per hour, the astronauts and cosmonauts aboard the International Space Station were fast asleep in weightlessness. It was just like any other night, or day, there really isn't much of a distinction up there. Around that time, back on Earth, Ground Control received an automatic warning from the station alerting them that somehow a pressure leak was occurring aboard the ISS. I don't think I need to tell you how dangerous that is in the vacuum of space. After the crew awoke, they were informed of the situation and were directed to find the cause of the leak as soon as possible. Although they weren't in any immediate danger at that moment per se, they discovered that the rate at which air was escaping from the spacecraft gave them only a week or two before the cabin would completely depressurize. Yeah. They went straight to work, searching desperately to figure out where the leak was coming from. Now, the International Space Station is huge, and the fact that air was leaking out so slowly meant that the puncture had to be extremely tiny, making it difficult to find. Eventually, luckily, the engineers aboard the station were able to discover exactly where the leak was coming from. A hole. Not a gap between modules or a bad seal, a tiny 2mm hole aboard the orbital module of the Russian Soyuz MS-9 spacecraft, which was docked with the ISS. Immediately after the discovery of the hole, it was sealed using special sealant and epoxy, evading a catastrophic loss of air pressure. Attention then shifted from the pressing danger of the situation to... what had caused it. Many initially suspected that the hole was caused by a tiny meteoroid which slammed into the side of the module, punching clean through the wall. However, upon closer inspection, things quickly became more complicated and a bit disconcerting. A media outlet known as RIA Novosti, owned and operated by the Russian government, reports that, quote, we are checking the earthbound version of events, but there is another version which we are not ignoring. Intentional action in space. There are traces made by several attempts to drill a hole. That's crazy though. I mean, there's no way someone would have intentionally drilled a hole into the side of the ISS while in space. Right? Well, this is the unsettling part. Russia is right. If you look around the immediate location of the hole, there are several clear indications that a drill was used before eventually catching and puncturing the hole. The news agency reported that an investigative commission had actually ruled out a micrometeorite strike entirely after closer inspection of the hole, and had narrowed the cause down to either the extremely careless mistake of a technician, or to deliberate sabotage since, quote, it is clear that the damage was caused from inside the spacecraft. Currently, according to NASA, the prevailing theory is that the hole was caused as a result of a drilling accident during production back on Earth before it was even sent up to space. However, if that's true, how do we explain the fact that the Soyuz had been docked with the ISS for two months by this point? Surely, if the hole had been there the entire time, the pressure leak would have been detected much sooner. NASA has explained that the hole may have been repaired with glue after the accident was made, and that it came loose at some point while the crew was asleep. Personally, though, I believe that this explanation is making a lot of assumptions. First, it assumes that the Soyuz quality control apparently allowed for someone back on the ground during production to drill a hole into the wall with a hand-operated drill. It doesn't even seem like there's any reason for a hole to have been in that precise location on the wall of the spacecraft. So this would have had to have been a pretty big slip-up. 
Russian news outlets have accused a female astronaut of apparently drilling the hole in the side of the spacecraft on purpose as the result of an emotional breakdown they were having in space. It's said that she may have tried to do this in order to get everyone to evacuate and go back home. These claims are generally regarded as false because it just doesn't make a lot of sense that an astronaut would try and sabotage the entire International Space Station. Um, but from there, we're really just left to draw our own conclusions. The Sleeping Girl of Turville in 1870, an 11-year-old girl named Ellen Sadler lived in the small village of Turville in the United Kingdom. Their family was large, consisting of 12 children, with most members of the family working as farmhands. Earlier that year, Ellen had attempted to earn money for her family through employment as a nursemaid in the nearby town of Marlow. However, during her time working there, Ellen would experience episodes of severe drowsiness and exhaustion which eventually led her to being released from the position. Her fatigue would slowly worsen as time went on, eventually becoming such a burden that she was seen by a doctor, who believed that she had contracted some kind of a spinal disease due to several swellings which were observed on the back of her head. After several weeks of her condition worsening, Ellen was admitted to a nearby hospital for nearly five months before being released in March of 1871. The doctors were forced to let her go, having been unable to diagnose the girl's condition. Her health quickly began to deteriorate even further, before she would even make it home from the hospital, in fact. On the ride home, Ellen would begin to feel drowsy, and eventually suffered from several seizures. Later that month, she suffered another bout of seizures before her doctor states that she rolled over to lie on her left side with her hand under her head. She wouldn't move from that position, apparently, for years. Now this sounds absurd, right? I mean, this was clearly just some kind of a publicity stunt. It makes total sense. An impoverished family with a sick daughter needs cash and comes up with an ingenious plan to make some easy money. However, this doesn't seem plausible for a multitude of reasons. Indeed, Ellen became a sort of local celebrity, and her case became a widely known and strange medical mystery, with plenty of doctors and investigators rushing to the small town to see Ellen, who by this point had been asleep for years. One account of several men who came to visit goes as follows. After climbing the rickety stairs and walking along to the room with the sloping roof, we saw, in the smaller bed, a girl laying on her left side with her hand on the pillow under her head. Her soft dark brown hair was confined in an old net and appeared to be very matted, a condition her mother explained by saying she did not want to comb it for fear of disturbing her. As the men gazed upon the little girl, taking note of her sunken eyes and pale face, they believed the girl was dead. More and more visitors would come to see her as the years went on, journalists, doctors, religious members, and others from all across the United Kingdom. Strangely, Ellen's mother would even allow some of the visitors to clip off some of the girl's hair as a kind of souvenir. She also appeared to have regular breathing patterns, and her skin seemed warm just like any other healthy person though her body seemed somewhat thin and weak, with her lower half apparently feeling almost ice-cold to the touch. Now, there's a huge hole in the story that I'm sure many of you have already picked up on, and it's been a huge point of controversy since this happened. And that's that this was all happening way back in the 1870s, before IV drip or feeding tubes were a thing. How was she given food and water? According to her mother, the girl was given wine, tea, sugar, milk, gruel, and broth, among other things, which were simply poured into her mouth using the spout of a small teapot. Eventually, though, the girl's jaw apparently locked shut, resulting in the doctor and mother feeding her between some missing teeth. You might be thinking this sounds insane, and so were the people who heard about this case as it was occurring. 
As a result, some of the skeptical local doctors came up with a plan to try and get Ellen to slip up and prove the whole thing to be a hoax. A doctor carefully hid a sharp, pointed needle up their sleeves before visiting the family's home, just as plenty of others had done before them. The mother welcomed them inside and took them up to the bedroom, where they saw the sleeping girl, who was apparently still laying on her side even after all this time. The doctor, upon reaching the girl's bedside and without the mother paying any attention, pricked Ellen in the leg with the needle. Nothing. Miraculously, she didn't react at all. The doctor was dumbfounded. There were apparently several other copycats who tried to pull off the same exact needle trick in various ways over the years, often showing up at odd, random times in the hopes of catching the family off guard. However, none of them were ever able to get the girl to react at all, and nobody ever saw her moved from that exact position for the entire time this went on. It seemed that, somehow, against all odds, this girl really had been asleep for years. As the years went on, the girl's body began to appear emaciated and severely malnourished. However, without the ability to chew or to eat food normally, there wasn't much that could be done. In 1880, the girl, or woman rather, 10 years older and now 21, woke up. When she did, she was informed of the death of her mother, which had occurred around a half a year prior to her awakening. The news broke that the girl had miraculously woken up, and the country was absolutely rocked. It took quite a while for Ellen's mind and body to recover from the incident, but by the year 1901, she would be married, raising several children of her own. Now, I have a lot of thoughts about this one. First, I do want to mention that it's entirely possible that this was just a hoax. However, it starts to get kind of nuts when we consider what this implies. If we assume that the mother and daughter actually did come up with this crazy plan and were just pretending to have her be asleep for all these years, that means that she willingly stayed inside of this house for 10 years. If the primary goal was just to gather money from donations and visitors, is that really worth sacrificing half of your life over? I'm sure Ellen and her family would have rather her lived a normal life as opposed to pulling off this insane stunt. With the crazy amount of attention that was on her by that point, she really couldn't have gone anywhere or done anything outside of the house. And the craziest part is that all of that is the most logical explanation here. Even so, if she really was awake the entire time, how did she not respond to the needle pricks by the doctors? Imagine that you're pretending to be asleep, and somebody walks in and, without any warning, sticks a massive needle in your leg. You would probably react at least a little bit, but apparently she didn't even jolt. There was no reaction, and they did this multiple times on many different occasions. Some believe that Ellen's condition was the result of narcolepsy, while others believe that the mother actually drugged her for all those years in order to profit off the situation. No matter what conclusion you want to draw from this story, the truth behind the sleeping girl of Turville will probably forever remain a mystery. The Devil's Footprints Our next story takes place even further back than the previous one, in the year 1855. On the night of February 8th, a heavy winter storm passed through southwest England, blanketing several towns in snow. The following morning, those living in the area would make a peculiar discovery. Hoof prints in the snow. This didn't appear to be of much interest at first, until more and more people awoke to notice the prints. Hundreds of people, all across southwest England. Whatever it was had traveled to more than 30 different locations across many different towns in the region, apparently traversing 40 to 100 miles or more in that one single night. 
One news report stated the following. It appears on Thursday, last night, there was a very heavy snowfall in the neighborhood of Exeter and the south of Devon. On the following morning, the inhabitants of the above towns were surprised at discovering the footmarks of some strange and mysterious animal. To make things even more strange, there were numerous accounts that these footprints had traversed across seemingly impossible paths. Continuing in straight lines, the prince would, apparently, jump right on top of the roofs of houses, over impossibly high walls, and then back down again, continuing on as if they weren't even there in the first place. Things became even more confusing upon closer inspection of the footprints, which appeared in a very unnatural manner. At first, it was noted that the prints appeared to resemble those of a donkey's, but strangely, because of the layout of the prints, it's very unlikely that they were made by an animal with four legs. In fact, some even report that somehow the imprints were laid out in the snow in a single file line. The strange circumstances of the footprints, along with the fact that they seem to have mostly appeared over the course of a single night, have led them to be dubbed as the Devil's Footprints. There are a few different hypotheses behind the hoof prints, some of which make more sense than others. One theory that circulated at the time was that the tracks may have actually been caused by a kangaroo who escaped from a local exhibition in one of the areas. However, upon closer inspection, this is unlikely for several reasons. First, although kangaroo tracks are similar to the ones seen that day, they clearly do differ in appearance. It also came out sometime later that this theory may have actually been completely made up by a local reverend who wanted to calm the fears of people who were afraid of going out after dark. There also doesn't seem to really be any evidence of an escaped kangaroo outside of these rumors. With that being said, the most likely theory that I came across was that the tracks were actually caused by wood mice, which kind of hop in the snow, leaving behind a similar pattern. However, this doesn't explain the impossibly vast distances that the tracks apparently went, and also doesn't explain how they apparently passed right over houses and walls, as if they weren't even there. Jerome of Sandy Cove. Now, we're not going to come back to the present just yet. For our next story, we're staying in the mid-1800s, but we'll be traveling to Nova Scotia, Canada, to a beach known as Sandy Cove. The date was September 8th, 1863. A young eight-year-old boy was playing in the sand, searching for trinkets and other interesting things. The boy's name was George Colin Albright, or Collie for short, and he was certainly about to find something interesting. He spotted something odd sticking up from the sand. He innocently frolicked over, intrigued by the strange sight. However, he quickly realized that what he was looking at was no object. It was a person missing both of their legs. The boy approached, but was quickly frightened by what he was looking at and ran off trying to find someone to help the man. However, being just an eight-year-old boy, he initially had some trouble getting anyone to believe him. Eventually, he was able to win the attention of a pair of farmers who followed him to the shore, and discovered that the boy had been telling them the truth. The man, still alive, was rescued from the beach and brought to the boy's home in a nearby village where he was nursed back to health. He was a well-built man, but was strangely quiet. He said almost nothing to the boy's family. When asked for his name, he said something which resembled Jerome, and 
That's what he would be referred to from then on. Upon closer inspection, it was noted that both of Jerome's legs had been amputated just above the knees. The amputation appeared to have been performed by a skilled surgeon and had to have been done recently, as the stumps were still bandaged and were only partially healed. Jerome also appeared to have been suffering from hypothermia at the time he was rescued. As the days went on, word quickly spread about Jerome through the surrounding area, who, for some mysterious reason, didn't appear to be able to talk. Many locals became fascinated with Jerome and the enigma surrounding him, and wanted to meet him. Many would come to visit, even while he still lay recovering in bed. After all of these visits, it became clear that he did not understand English, French, Latin, Italian, or Spanish. He quickly grew a distaste for these strange visitors, and he began growling like an animal whenever a new visitor would enter the home. Jerome was described as having a Mediterranean appearance and soft hands. Many tried to speculate who he was and where he came from. Some believed that he may have been a wounded soldier of the Civil War, which had still been raging in the U.S. at the time of Jerome's discovery. His visitors would question him, prying for information, but still, he didn't say a word. Despite the good intentions and hospitable nature of the Albrights, they were a family of poor fishermen and eventually could no longer support Jerome. They ended up shipping him off to the nearby French community Metgen, where he would live for the rest of his life. He stayed with a woman named Jean Nicola, who was also unable to get him to talk, but still housed him for seven years. The government of Nova Scotia would eventually vote for a special stipend each week to support Jerome. However, after the woman's passing, Jerome would move in with a new family, the Comos, who exploited the man's local fame by charging admission fees to see him. He would pass away on April 15, 1912, nearly 50 years after his discovery on the beach. Now, nothing is really known for sure about where Jerome came from, but the following theory is probably the most plausible one that I've come across. The following is an excerpt of an article from the Life as a Human magazine on the Jerome case. They discuss the story of a man who lived just across the bay in the town of Chipman, New Brunswick, in the year 1859. The young stranger somehow managed to fall through river ice, but was miraculously saved when discovered by two brothers. Eventually, he developed gangrene in both legs and had bilateral amputations performed by Dr. Harry Peters. Here, he became known as Gamby, probably because on waking, he kept calling for Gamba, Italian for legs. Gamby proved a burden for the good people of Chipman. It would appear a passing schooner captain was paid handsomely to transport the disabled man to a better place. This theory is basically stating that he was taken out to sea by this captain and was to be disposed of. However, that's only if, and it's a big if, this story about Gamby, which is over 150 years old, is true and was actually Jerome. There's also another rumor that one of the few things Jerome ever muttered was that he had been on a ship called the Columbo. Still, take all of that with a grain of salt as it's impossible to verify any of these stories or if Jerome was even able to talk at all. Now, without regard to any of that, it's still a huge question as to why Jerome was unable to speak. Maybe the events that led to him appearing on the beach had actually sparked some sort of brain damage in him, and he lost his ability to process language. Although we'll probably never know the truth behind who Jerome was, it's pretty clear that something terrible happened to him. Chatsworth Crash Phone Calls September 12th, 2008 had started out as a pretty average day for 46-year-old Robert Sanchez, a train engineer working for Metrolink. The commuter train was carrying 225 passengers and was passing through the Chatsworth neighborhood of Los Angeles at 4.22 p.m. that afternoon. 
Sanchez, in full control of the train, had been on his phone, texting back and forth with a rail fan. Immediately after sending a string of messages, Sanchez looked up and locked eyes with the crew of the freight train that was headed directly for them. The crew inside the other train immediately pulled their emergency brake just two seconds before they slammed into each other at a brutal combined speed of nearly 85 miles per hour. Now, train collisions are nothing like car crashes. Car accidents usually start and finish in a matter of seconds. However, trains have an unfathomable amount of momentum, causing a devastating amount of damage. The accident resulted in the deaths of 25 people and injured 135 others, 46 of which were in critical condition. Although the accident was a terrible tragedy, it was far from unexplainable. Fault was immediately placed upon Robert Sanchez, the engineer who, just before the crash, had plowed straight past a red signal, failing to give the right of way to the other train where the double track merged into a single line. However, something very difficult to explain had occurred in the immediate aftermath of the tragedy, beneath the rubble. Aboard the Metrolink commuter train had been a man by the name of Charles Peck, a uh, father of three. The man was engaged to a woman named Andrea Katz, who heard about the train crash over her car's radio as she was on her way to go pick him up from the station. At first, of course, she was extremely worried about her fiancé. However, after pulling over, she checked her phone and saw that she had several very recent missed calls from Charles' number. The only logical conclusion that she could draw from this was that he had survived. She reached out to Charles' family members, and they all met up in Chatsworth in an attempt to rescue him from the rubble. Strangely, Charles would apparently keep calling his fiance, but when she would answer, desperately trying to figure out if he was okay, there would be nothing but static on the end of the line. It was extremely eerie, and nobody knew what to make of the calls. As the night went on, though, things would only continue to get more and more strange. Soon, each of his family members began to receive calls from his cell phone as well. One by one, each of them would receive these calls, which would come in for the remaining hours of the evening and late into the night. When they would answer there would be no response except for the faint hum of static. The family stayed up, restless, working with the first responders who were desperately trying to locate Charles and the others who were aboard the train at the time of the collision. His fiancée Andrea would shout words of encouragement through the phone whenever he called, informing him that rescuers were on their way and were close to finding him. Still, there would be no response. The police, aware of the bizarre phone calls, started tracing the signal from Charles' phone to try and locate him, which pointed to the general area of the wreck. The calls finally stopped at around 3 o'clock a.m. the next morning. Those involved in the situation at the time believed that, trapped within the wreckage, Charles had been too injured to talk. An hour after the final phone call was received, the rescuers finally found him. He was dead. Upon investigation of the body, it was determined that Charles had died upon impact, and that it would have been impossible for him to have placed any calls from his phone, let alone for him to have been alive for 11 hours. Strangely, it doesn't seem that the police ever found the phone in the rubble. Maybe it was destroyed, maybe it flew out of the train during the collision and landed somewhere, who knows. 
One idea that came to my mind was that maybe the phone wasn't even on the train in the first place. What if Charles had left the phone behind somewhere before getting on the train and the person who had it was trying to dial all these different numbers in order to contact whoever the owner was? This idea falls apart pretty quick though as the location of the phone was in fact traced back to the location of the train. Perhaps the phone was just damaged in the collision and was randomly making all these phone calls on its own. I'd say this is one of the more likely guesses, but even then, it placed 35 different calls to plenty of different people. The Grey Whale Cove Cliff Mystery on Monday, December 30th, 2019, on a road nearby the Grey Whale Cove State Beach, just south of the city of San Francisco, an immediately bizarre scene would be caught on a driver's dash cam. Apparently, this driver captured a video of a Lexus SUV flying straight off a cliff. Now, once word of the video broke out on the internet, many of those who saw it immediately believed that the video was a fake, intended to gain attention online. At first glance, it's hard to argue with this conclusion. We see all kinds of absurd content like this popping up all the time, often spreading all over YouTube and Instagram in a matter of days. That was the general consensus for a while, but as time went on and more information came to the surface, this scenario became less and less likely. For one, the California Highway Patrol has stated that investigators were actually sent to the location where this occurred just 20 minutes after it happened. There, they met the driver who recorded the footage and interviewed him on the spot. The authorities also took note of a set of tire tracks, which led right to the edge of the cliff. Furthermore, just several days later, a couple who had actually been driving just ahead of the man who recorded the video contacted CHP as well with confirmation that they had also seen the car drive off the cliff. Immediately, a search was conducted to figure out whoever the hell this was and to come to their aid by the extremely slim chance that they had survived the leap. But impossibly, the car was never found. Sometime later, a set of human remains, those of a missing woman named Tracy Sinclair, were found on the nearby beach. Sinclair was the owner of a 2007 Lexus SUV, which matches the one seen in the video. Conveniently, her driver's license was found near the remains, which seemed to have confirmed that she was the woman in the car. The biggest thing that confuses me about this story is that even after a massive search operation, they never found the car. It's just really strange. Nobody has found the vehicle to this day, even though it disappeared near a very popular beach just south of San Francisco. The December 3rd Mystery Explosions the video you're about to watch was recorded from a home security camera near Post Falls, Idaho on the 3rd of December, 2022. At exactly 7.13 p.m., a bright flash of light can be seen on the horizon, followed seconds later by a loud boom that shook the surrounding area. Immediately, everyone in the area took to social media trying to figure out what the hell had just happened? There were hundreds of witnesses of the bright light, and many more of the resulting shockwave. The explosion had been so powerful that windows and wall hangings in the area were disturbed. Because of the general area of where the explosion was seen, some suspected that it was the result of an explosion at a train yard located nearby. However, this claim was quickly put to rest after a statement by the Northern Lakes Fire District who announced that there had, in fact, been no fires reported at the trail yard or anywhere in the area at all. Apparently, they had found no evidence of the massive explosion whatsoever. Following the event, the Post Falls Police Department would contact the major utility companies in the area, 
inquiring about any potential blown transformers, but none were reported. Apparently, the explosion had been so large that it was picked up by local seismographs and identified as a, quote, unconfirmed quake or seismic-like event. But it gets weirder. Within around an hour, more than 2,000 miles east, another explosion was observed in southern New Jersey. Again, it was seen, heard, and felt by many different people and discussed extensively on social media by those affected. And just like the explosion in Idaho all the way on the other side of the United States, there didn't seem to be any evidence of an actual explosion anywhere in the surrounding area. The following post was made to Facebook regarding the incident in New Jersey. Did anyone hear what sounded like a loud boom around 9.30 p.m. on Saturday, December 3rd? There have been reports that it may have been a meteor exploding. Seen it on numerous other pages this evening. Another post made to the South Jersey subreddit was posted just 10 minutes after the explosion occurred, where OP asked, did anybody else just hear two loud explosions at around 9.30 p.m.? Plenty of others told their accounts of what they heard and saw, along with a security video of the explosion. These weren't the only explosions reported that night. In fact, they were reported all over the Northern Hemisphere, notably in the cities of Grand Rapids, Michigan, Buffalo, New York, and Edmonton, Alberta. No cause was ever determined for any of the explosions. So we know that this wasn't an earthquake, and we also know that there was no damage ever found on the ground as a result of these explosions. Before all of the separate incidents were connected, many different people assumed that they were the result of an asteroid coming down from space. Perhaps they were small enough to burn up in the atmosphere and never crash landed on Earth, which is why we never saw any impacts on the ground. However, if you look up other videos of meteors burning up in the atmosphere, you'll find that it usually isn't just a quick burst of light or a loud boom. It's usually more of a slow burn, which takes at least a couple of seconds to dissipate. Even still, I'm not sure that a meteor shower is enough to explain all these different explosions all over the continent. The Disappearance of Zygmunt Adamski It was the 6th of June, 1980. A 56-year-old man named Zygmunt Adamski, a Polish immigrant and coal miner living in West Yorkshire in the UK, left his home for a walk to buy groceries... and never returned. His wife Lottie's initial suspicion was that he had been kidnapped. His family swiftly reported him missing, and a large-scale search operation was executed to try and locate him, though initially there were very few leads. A few days later, on the 9th of June, Adamski was discovered in a very bizarre way. He was dead, lying on top of a 10-foot-high pile of coal in the town of Todd Morden. 20 miles away from where he was last seen. The location of his body was puzzling, as it seemed unlikely that he could have gotten all the way on top of the pile by accident. Upon closer inspection of Adamski's body, plenty of unusual circumstances immediately stood out. The first was the absolutely terrified expression on his face. The police chief investigating the case stated that it looked as though Adamski had literally been frightened to death. Those eyes were staring up at me. I was looking down on him from a foot away. Those eyes sent a shudder down my spine. They were wide open. He had a look of someone who had seen something or someone that had scared him to death. He was found with a number of strange marks and burns all over his body, which had apparently been treated with a strange ointment that couldn't be identified by forensic scientists. Although Adamski was wearing a suit jacket, his shirt, 
wallet and watch were completely missing. His hair had also been cropped in what the local police chief described as a roughly cut manner. He was also found with only a single day's growth of beard on his face, indicating that he died rather soon after his disappearance. After the coroners examined Adamski, they found no injuries on his body to explain the cause of death, which was eventually determined to have been the result of a heart attack. James Turnbull, the coroner who dealt with Adamski's death, told the BBC in 2003 that it was the biggest mystery of his career. There were a barrage of different theories as to what happened to Adamski, some of which were more believable than others. Some believe that he was involved in some sort of a paranormal incident, while others believe that he was the victim of a murder, accidental or otherwise. Either way, the fact that he apparently died of a heart attack just complicates this whole thing way more. Nobody was ever charged in connection with the case. And that wraps up the final layer of the Unexplained Incidents Iceberg. Again, this was the first iceberg that I ever made myself, and to be honest, I had a lot of fun doing all the research for the different entries. Now, I definitely want to make icebergs a more regular part of this channel, so if you have any other ideas for what the next one should be, be sure to leave them in the comments below. 